The scripture reading this evening will be taken from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of swords and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his swords. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, and being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. <coughs> And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. It was my privilege, as Brother White has mentioned, to be with some of the young people this evening, and I enjoyed their visit very much. I like to encourage young people in the Lord's work and service. I want them to be gospel preachers and teachers of God's Word in the coming years. I want to say a few words by way of thanks before introducing the lesson of the hour. This is another good audience. We have a number of gospel preachers present and members of congregations in this area. I want to thank all of you for coming. Many of you have been here several times. I have thoroughly enjoyed this gospel meeting with this fine congregation. Brother White has done so much to encourage people to come and to attend the meeting. And you all have been nice in so many wonderful ways. Different brethren have led the singing during the meeting, and different ones have had a part in taking care of me by meals and entertainment. But I want to especially thank Una and her husband for the kindness shown unto me. As many of you know, she's a relative of mine. I think we'd say about second person. But anyway, they took care of me when I was here before and had the heart attack and was in the hospital for a few days. And then after that, I went to the home of Una and Roy, and they took care of me in a nice way until the doctor permitted me to go back home on the plane. And so they've taken care of me this week also, and I've enjoyed being with them very, very much. Now, so many things I'd like to say by way of appreciation to all of you, but thank you so very, very much. After the service tonight, I do plan to be going back to Tennessee and I will be with the uh, Pulaska, Tennessee congregation in a vacation Bible school speaking Sunday morning at all the services and then Monday night through Thursday night. On Friday, I'll be engaged in making some more radio talks or sermons for worldwide evangelism. Brother Beasley, who makes possible this work, says that the radio sermons are reaching several thousands of people every week, and many people are being baptized, and congregations are being established. And I look forward to making those tapes, and then returning home on Saturday. My grandson Prentice is here tonight, and glad to see him again. He lives in this area. 
Now, why he moved up from Tennessee to this state, I don't know, but that's what he did. And so he's up here, and I'm glad to see him again and have him in the audience. Now, I'll not be able to say a lot of things I'd like to say tonight on this subject, but it's one that concerns all of us. I don't care who you are, young or old, member of the church or not, we're going to die one of these days. In the long ago, Job asked the question, Job 14, 14, If a man die, shall they live again? Is there anything beyond this earthly life? Or does this life end all? There are those today who often talk about it. I don't think there's anything beyond. This is all there is. When you die, it's all over. Like the little dog Rover. It's all over. Is that right? We do not believe that, of course. God knew that we would be concerned about it. So he has said some things in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New, concerning this great subject. And I want to point out some of those things tonight. I was talking to a lady several days ago concerning this theme, and I said, Do you know that there are religious people today who think that they can be baptized to benefit someone who lived and died and wasn't baptized? She said, no, I didn't know that. Well, I said, that's true. Absolutely. Then again, I said, do you think that the spirit of an individual comes back to live in a baby again? Maybe and alive, and then maybe come back again, called reincarnation? No, I didn't know that. Well, I said, I preach to people like that. They do. There's some who have that idea. So I'll not be able to cover all of those things tonight, but I do want to talk about some of them. Now then, question number one. What is man anyway? And when we go to Genesis chapter 1, we read that God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. Man is created in the image, in the likeness of God. And God is a spirit. And we have a spirit, our soul, that dwells within this physical mortal body. You say, I think, I remember. Is it your bones and your flesh that's remembering? Why, of course not. Something remembers. You say, my body. Well, what's the my? It's that immortal spirit that dwells within this physical body. That's the teaching of the Bible. And then again, in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, we read that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth, that is, his body, and breathed in the man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So there is that immortal part about man. And the Bible teaches that. Number two, what is the meaning of death? Death does not mean ceasing to be. It means separation or departure of the spirit from the body. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12 and verse 7, as given by Solomon, Speaking of death, that then the man, his body, the dust, shall return to earth as it came, but the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And in James 2 and verse 24, the body, I mean, uh, yes, the body without the spirit is dead, just like faith without works is a dead faith. So what is the meaning of death? We read also in Genesis 35 that when Rachel died, Benjamin was born, and as the child was born and she was dying, the Bible says her soul departed. Her soul left the body. That was physical death. The ancient Pharisees believed that there was a future life and the resurrection. But the Sadducees denied that, and they often discussed it. And once the Sadducees approached Christ, 
with what they thought was a hard question to answer if there's a future life. He said there was a woman, and her husband died. She married again. He died, married again. He died, married again. You remember that. And finally, seven had her. Now, they said, in the resurrection, the future state, who shall she be? Because all seven had her. You know, that'd be a ridiculous situation, all seven claiming the same woman. And Jesus said, you to her, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor given in marriage, but equal to the angels. But that the dead are raised, that they do exist, and are in existence. God said that to Moses in the long ago, and they claimed to accept the writings of Moses. When God appeared to Moses at the burning bush, what did God say? He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus said, He's not the God of the dead, that is, that you think of, dead, those that don't exist, but of the living. For all live unto Him. Now, Jesus used present tense. I am, right now, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, they had been dead for a number of years, and their bodies buried in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. I've been there. He didn't say, I was their God while they lived and were in existence. I am right now the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are living. I want to tell you something. Right now, 8 o'clock, Time, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are in existence. They have not ceased to be. And we are eternal beings. We will never cease to be. We are immortal beings created in the image of God. In the story that was read a few moments ago, Christ's language about the rich man and Lazarus. They both died, but they both were in existence. The rich man begged for mercy. It was denied him. People often ask the question, are the dead still in existence? Yes, they are. Well, can they remember? Yes, the rich man remembered. I have five brothers back in yonder's world. I want them to warn. I don't want them to live and die as I did and come to the place of torment. And he was told the reason why he was in torment, Son, remember that you in your lifetime had the evil things, the wretches and all, ignored the poor man. He's now comforted and you are tormented. You remember that? Yes, I remember that. Do you remember many of you coming Sunday morning when I was here and began this meeting? Well, it's not your flesh and blood and bones that remembering, but you remember, don't you? And if this spirit leaves this physical body, this house, it will still remember. The Bible speaks of the house as a tabernacle in which we live, in which we dwell. Here is a family that's living here in this area. And tomorrow they pick up the furniture and all, and they move over to another part of the city. This house is empty where they once lived. They're living somewhere else now. Here we are living, existing in this earthly house called the body. What is death? It's moving out of it. It's leaving it. It's going on. Now, that's the teaching of the Bible concerning death. It's not ceasing to be, not at all. When the Apostle Paul was old and in prison at Rome, realizing that probably he would soon be beheaded by old Nero, the wicked ruler, and it is thought that that did actually happen about the year 68 A.D., I don't know, but anyway... When he wrote his last letter to Timothy, charging him to preach the word, you remember he said the time 
of my departure is at hand. Departure come from a Greek word, just like a ship that is anchored here at shore, ready to pick up the weights and lift the weight and go across on the other side. He didn't say the time for me to cease to be is near, but for me to make a departure, to depart. I had this very plainly given to me several years ago as I was preaching in New Zealand. I went through the North Island, and then I was to preach in the South Island. And so the brethren said, well, you can get on the little ship, and it'll take you across to the South Island, and the brethren can meet you there. So they took me to the boat, and I got on the boat, and it was a nice day, and I sat outside with many others, and soon those on the north side waving goodbye to us, couldn't see them anymore. And then finally, I saw the South Island and those that were waiting for us over here. And soon we were coming and we began to wave. And they began to wave to welcome us. I said, this is Second Timothy chapter 4. Here it is. Goodbye here. Welcome over here. The time for me to depart has come. I realized that. But I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, meaning the judgment day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Brethren, that's the teaching of the Bible. Sunset, an evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning at the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide is moving, seems asleep, too full for sound or foam, which that withdrew from out the boundless deep turns again home. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark. And may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out I born of time and place, the flood may bear me far. I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. That's Tennyson's poem. And he got it from the Bible, didn't he? He certainly did. Now then, the soul continues to exist. The soul is conscious. The soul remembers. Now then, where does this departed soul go? Go somewhere to depart and to be with Christ, said Paul in the Philippian letter, is far better. But where? Someday the body will be raised, immortal and incorruptible, and we will dwell in that immortal body, and then will come the judgment, and then eternity for everybody, either heaven or hell. Now, let's have the chart, please. And I'll show you what the Bible teaches. Death, the individual enters into this realm, and the word is Hades. I recognize the fact that in our King James translation, the word is hell. But I have pointed out already that when our King James translation was made, they are often used Hades and Gehenna, the place of everlasting punishment, as we think of hell as one word, hell. And so in the American Standard Version, the word is Hades. And in our New King James translation, the word is Hades. Now what does Hades mean? It is the realm of disembodied spirits, the individual waiting for the resurrection of the body and the judgment and eternity. Now then, in the Hadean realm, there is rest or paradise. Jesus said to the thief, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. From the 16th chapter of the book of Luke, the word is Hades. I'm sorry that when the individual made this tape for me, he left out chapter 16 and put the verses 19 to 31 here. 16 belongs here as the chapter. Well, all right. 
In the second chapter of the book of Acts, we have Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he refers to David's prophecy concerning the resurrection of Christ, that he, that is his body, was not left in the grave long enough to undergo corruption, neither was his spirit left long enough in the Hadean realm. He came out of Hades. Now, I know the King James translation says hell, but it was not this hell in the sense of everlasting punishment. It's Hades. He came out of Hades and built his church and established Christianity. Christ went to Hades, and Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And so there is the joy and the happiness of those in the Hadean realm spoken of as paradise, a place of enjoyment here upon this earth. The Garden of Eden was in a sense paradise, and the eternal home of the soul heaven is paradise in that sense. Just like we could speak of Detroit being a city. New York City is a city. Dallas, Texas is a city. Which city? So this has an idea about it. Now, I know there are some today who think when you die, you go directly to heaven or you go directly to hell. Then you have to come back, I suppose, to go to the judgment, and the Lord will say to the wicked, depart. He ought to say, depart again and go to Gehenna or hell. Come, come again and enter into heaven. He doesn't say that. When we read of the judgment day of our Lord from Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, Before him shall be gathered all nations. He'll separate the one from the other. And to those on the right hand, he'll say, Come, you blessed. And they'll enter into the eternal home of the soul, heaven. And to those on the left-hand side, he'll say, Depart. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. And that word is Gehenna. Gehenna. And in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, we have Jesus saying, Fear not them that can kill the body, and that's all they can do. They cannot destroy your soul, but fear him that's able to send both soul and body to hell, to Gehenna. And so Jesus didn't go to Gehenna. He went to Hades. And the rich man and Lazarus were in Hades. And the gulf was fixed, and I'll say more about that later. Now, here's the word Tartars in Second Peter 2 and verse 4. And in the footnote of the American Standard Version, the word at the bottom of the page is Tartars, and that means the place of torment in the Hadean realm for wicked angels awaiting their judgment and for their final punishment in Gehenna. Hell prepared for the devil and the angels. So understand the meaning of these words as used in the Bible. The individual departs, and someday there will be the resurrection of the body. We go to 1 Corinthians 15 and read about the resurrection. Paul said, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the eternal home of the soul to Christians. That is, this flesh and blood body. It's not suited for the eternal home of the soul. It has to become an immortal body, incorruptible body, where we live and never grow old. Well, what about those who are living here upon this earth when the Lord comes again at the end of time? Well, their bodies will have to be changed. We shall not all sleep, that is, die, but we shall all be changed. We have to be changed to an immortal body. Now then, I want to ask you a question. We've got preachers in the audience and a lot of good Bible teachers. I've been told that there are about six and a half billion people on this earth tonight. Now, when the Lord comes again and all those who have ever lived, I don't know how many that would be, they'll be raised in immortal bodies. And those who are living... Their bodies will be changed to immortal bodies. Now, how long is it going to take the Lord to do that? That'll take a long time, won't it? Huh? You don't think so? Just think about it. Raising all the dead? Changing all the living? Don't think so? 
I don't think so either. The Apostle Paul said, We shall all be changed in a moment. That's right, in a moment. In a split second. Quicker than you can bat your eye. By divine power. That's the teaching of the Bible. God is eternal. He created the heavens and the earth. He created man. Here we are on the earth. Now we're living at a time when people can go up above the earth. They can go to the moon. They come back, but they'll go around the earth. Here it is, poised in space. How can it stay up there? By divine power. God Almighty created it. Sun, moon, and stars, and the various planets. And that's the God that can change the body from a mortal body to an immortal body. Whether we have been buried in the sea or on earth or when it was, or change our bodies from mortal bodies to immortal bodies. That's the teaching of the Bible. So, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. The twinkling of the light, the last trump, trumpet shall sound, and there will be that change. Then, I think we can look back and say, Now, grave, you one time got me, but that's all over. Hades will be no more. It will be destroyed. That's right. No more. And then Paul could say, But thanks be unto God, who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I'm glad we were singing that song, Victory in Jesus, a few moments ago. After saying that, then Paul said to close the thought, Therefore, let us be unmovable and faithful and always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And when we turn to the book of Revelation, and read chapter 21 and the first part of chapter 22. We have eternal joys spoken of. No death, no pain, no sorrow, no sad farewells. I'm glad I won't have to go to the hospital again, aren't you? We won't have to go and get a prescription filled again, will we? Of course not. Our bodies will not become old. No, not at all. I was preaching one time and I said... No cemeteries in heaven. No funeral services. No hospitals. No doctors there. I thought, no, I shouldn't say it like that. I said, we won't need doctors there. <laughs> we may have doctors in heaven, but we won't need any doctors there. That's all over. It's all gone. No more. That's the teaching of the Bible. What about the future? There it is. You see it on the diagram. And that's the teaching of the Word of the Lord. Let's be faithful, unmovable, always abounding in the work and in the service of the Lord. Now then, I said I'd go back just a moment. The rich man and Lazarus. Can we make a change? No. The gulf is fixed. The gulf means the division. It's fixed. And there can be no crossing. What about praying for the dead? The Bible doesn't teach that. Can do any good. What about the dead praying for us here upon this earth? Doesn't do any good. Can I be baptized to benefit someone who wasn't baptized? No, of course not. Now's the time for him to obey the Lord. He can't get someone to do it for him after he leaves this world. What about the dead communicating with people here upon this earth, in this realm, the earth? The Bible doesn't teach that fortune tellers and so on like that. Nothing on earth but the work of the devil. It's wrong. But friends, in a sense, there is a gulf that exists today. There are little children who are safe of such as the kingdom of heaven. Now those who have been saved, Christian, children of God. But there are those who are lost in sin, sinners. There's a gulf that separates these. We understand that. But the gulf hasn't been fixed. Now then, let me just give this illustration. Suppose in this audience tonight, 
here is a member of the church, and here is one not a member of the church, and you're sitting side by side. Now there's a gulf between you. One's in Christ, one out of Christ. One saved, one lost. Now, suppose both of you should get in a car after the service concludes and start down the street. And down here at the intersection, there's a wreck. And both of you are killed. And both of your spirits go into the Hadean realm, out of the body. Now then, can this individual, not a Christian, now obey the gospel and be baptized and become a Christian? No, no. The gulf is fixed. And there can be no crossing in any way whatsoever. It's too late. Well, can someone here on this earth do something to benefit that person? No. No, not at all. When the rich man begged for mercy, as the Scripture was read, the answer was, well, now, your brothers have Moses and the prophets. That is the Old Testament Scriptures. We have the Old Testament. We have the New Testament today. Now, let your brothers listen to the Word of God. Well, they won't listen to it. Well, they wouldn't be persuaded, though one were to rise from the dead and go back and try to preach to them if they won't listen to the Word of God. The gulf is fixed. There is no crossing in any way whatsoever. Now, I hope that you can understand this. Now, I want to suggest to you as good students of the Bible what I think I've already mentioned, maybe. You get at least a New Testament of the American Standard Version of 1901. And in the footnote, you will find the word Gehenna. Every time the word is translated hell, you'll find the footnote Tartars for the place of torment in the Hadean realm. And you'll have the word Hades in Acts 2. You'll have Hades in Luke 16 and in other places, and that Hades will be no more. It would be fine if you had a complete Bible with the Old Testament also. The Old Testament word was Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, and it was not translated C-O as it is in the American Standard Version. I recommend the King James Version, the New King James Version, the American Standard Version, and the New American Standard Bible for your study. But please understand that Jesus did not go to hell when he died, and the Spirit was in the world of the Spirit realm. He was in Hades, not in Gehenna. But he came out of Hades. His body came out of the tomb. He built the church. And Jesus said, the time is coming, the hour is coming. John 5, when all that are in their graves shall hear his voice and will come forth. They who have done good, the resurrection of life, and they who have done evil, the resurrection of condemnation. At the judgment day, when all are there, according to Matthew 25, the Lord will say to come, come. And they will enter the heaven, the eternal home of the soul. The others depart, and they will go away in their everlasting punishment. In Mark 9, we have where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. It's everlasting existence in torment and anguish and in despair. In the body, yes. And in heaven is joy and peace forever and forever. Now, to Canaan land, I'm on my way, where the soul of man never dies. Wow, who are here tonight in this audience, you will be here or here beyond the judgment in eternity. You are immortal beings. You will never cease to exist. Never. It isn't a question how long you may live here upon this earth, but how you live while you're here on this earth. I can say you will never cease to exist. So be faithful, obedient to the Lord, and heaven may be your home. And blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They do rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Well, you've listened very carefully. I've referred to the time when Rachel died, and Benjamin was born. Her soul departed or left the body. 
and the departure of the soul and the verses of Scripture. I hope this has been of help to each one of you, and I want to thank you again for coming to this gospel meeting. There are those in this audience who need to be baptized. We're making our last appeal to you to come and confess your faith in Christ and obey the Lord and be baptized. The baptist is filled, the change of clothing provided, preacher waiting to assist you. If you haven't been faithful in the Lord's work and you don't want to die in the condition you're in, come and acknowledge wrongs and we'll pray with you and for you as a child of God. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Let us stand and sing.